This content is on Zuckerman's sensation seeking scale. And you can see here that we have a couple of people right here who are seeking sensations, one through drugs and the other through skydiving. And these are examples of the kinds of things we're talking about here. So sensation seeking is defined as, quote, the need for varied, novel, and complex sensations and experiences, and the willingness to take physical and social risks for the sake of such experiences. And this is from Zuckerman's original work. And um, so again, it's, he uses the word need in here. So this person needs to have these experiences. There's like something in them. And to the extent that they're going to take some serious risks in order to get them. So higher in sensation seeking is higher in these charts of qualities. So what's happening in the nervous system? So first off, it's not a pathology. So it's not considered that there's something wrong with this person, but these people might be more susceptible to substance abuse. Um, so that's one of the key um, things that we're exploring here in this first part of our content. So it's a combination of low cortical arousal and dopamine abnormalities. So when we say cortical arousal, we're talking about the frontal cortex, the part of the brain that's linked to um, like wise decision making, the part of the brain that's stimulated in people with attention deficit when they take medications uh, like Ritalin or Adderall. So uh, we can think of our frontal cortex as being like our executive helping us to prioritize and make good decisions. And then dopamine abnormalities. Dopamine is our pleasure hormone, and it's the, the hormone that floods our brains and our nervous system when we're doing something that gives us pleasure. And it's, it's nicely adaptive because if you get pleasure for doing something, you're likely to repeat it. Um, but if it takes a lot of something in order for you to experience that rush of hormone, then you have to have more stimulating activities. So these uh, characteristics are not necessarily limited to extroverts or people who um, have to have social engagement to feel more alert and aroused. But instead, these people may be extroverts, but not necessarily, but the primary motivation is to engage the environment in some way. So they can get these rewards, not just like in Eysenck's model, the cortical arousal needed to be enhanced in extroverts through engaging with other people. But in this dimension, in this aspect, these people can get the same increase in arousal into optimal arousal by engaging in the environment. So that's a little bit of a difference there from Isang's model. <clears throat> and what traits would you see? Hobbies might be riskier. They might operate under a BAS rather than a BIS framework. And you'll recall from Gray's model that we're talking about the behavioral activation system as opposed to the behavioral inhibitory system. And so you'll recall that people tend to divide fairly neatly into two camps with respect to their need for activation or inhibition. Um, and if you've forgotten that, take a look at the Gray lecture that's also here. And so they tend to seek a high level of stimulation beyond what might be optimal. Like if some people are satisfied using just a little bit of a drug or something like that, people who have this particular characteristic of sensation seeking would go for a lot more. So what makes you feel good, that other person might go for a lot more to have that same good feeling. So what kind of brain differences do we see? Um, well, first off, the brain structures that we're going to be talking about on this slide are the anterior cingulate cortex, the ACC, which in this framework, it regulates emotions. Now, you'll see the ACC involved in a lot of different brain models, like because it is a kind of a relay station, like it's involved in a lot of functions. But the aspect of it or the function of it that we're interested in here is its capacity to regulate emotions. So that means keep yourself from being overwhelmed by emotion or to suppress the emotion that might be present. And we're also looking at the insula, which is where body signals are first received and interpreted by the brain. So when something happens in your body, it's interpreted in this region, the insula. So high sensation seekers is our first model and they tend to have early and strong insula arousal. 
and delayed ACC activation, which gives them a stronger approach motivation. So you can see this in the framework. So first off, the insula is what's highlighted up here, and you can see it peaks. So this person who has this experience is who has something in their body that's happening to them is aware of it and interpreting it earlier than a typical person. And then that declines, and then in comes, and then their ACC, which would regulate and limit that emotion, actually drops off in response to that stimulus before it kicks in to tone down that emotion for them. So to just put what I wrote down here describing it, people with high sensation seeking, in these people, the body quickly receives the pleasurable body signal through the insula, and the part of the brain that would limit the experience of pleasure is delayed leading to a rapid and prolonged experience of pleasure and there, therefore a tendency to approach similar experiences. So this is that approach behavior that might also explain some of the things in Gray's model. So low sensation seekers have the opposite pattern. Um, you can see that they have low insula and slow insula arousal and strong ACC activation. So that leads them to want to withdraw. So we can see this bottom line here is showing the insula activation, which is actually pretty low. So the pleasure that comes from these body sensations is, is low. And then the inhibitory effects, regulating emotion, the ACC is pretty high. And so these people would tend to withdraw. They're not, as mo they're not motivated to move forward and approach this activity. They're motivated to withdraw. And I did write this out too. In other words, people with low sensation seeking have slower interpretation of pleasurable body signals through the insula and more rapid emotional constraint activation through the ACC, resulting in a tendency to withdraw from similar experiences. So that's a little bit of a difference that helps to explain what might be going on with these two types of people. Now we have four dimensions of sensation seeking. We have thrill and adventure seeking. Um, a tendency to move toward experiences of physical risk taking. We have experience seeking or a tendency to pursue new experiences through the mind and the senses. Disinhibition, which is a tendency toward hedonistic pursuit of pleasure through social activities. And boredom susceptibility, aversion to routine activities or work and to dull and boring people and a restlessness in an unchanging environment. Let's look at each of these a little more closely, but before we do, I'll point out that it, when you take your sensation seeking scale, if you get a high score, it's important to look and find out in which areas you're high. You already might obviously probably have a sense of which areas might be areas for you, but you should know that you could be, say, high in experience seeking, but low in thrill and adventure seeking. Or you could be high in disinhibition, you really want to go to those wild parties, but maybe you have uh, low experience seeking. You're not really looking for new and different experiences. So those are all different profiles that people who are high in sensation seeking might have. So let's first look at thrill and adventure seeking, which is one of the subscales of the measure. Um, and I've already read it. It consists of items related to interest in physical risk-taking activities like parachuting, skiing, and so forth. Um, running with the bulls is an example. Um, people who just, this is an activity that takes place in Spain. Um, swimming with sharks might be an activity. Climbing these really steep cliffs might be an activity that someone who is high in this might engage in. This BMX biking. Um, extreme mountain biking, like along this edge of the cliff. Now this person is getting a lot of arousal here. And I don't know about this, they're riding behind this, uh, this truck, so this is another example. Um, so these are all physical experiences um, that uh, some people really need to get engaged in. So the second is experience seeking. So this is new experiences through the mind and the senses. So these people aren't pushing forward into these physical activities. They're pushing forward into new sensory experience, like um, music, for example. I've put these music festivals here, or certain types of drugs that bring about a new experience. People who are high in this dimension um, might 
have those sorts of interests, as well as a spontaneous lifestyle, like traveling and associated, associating with unusual type of persons. So, um, you know, this kind of exotic travel, doing things that are really different. This isn't necessarily dangerous. This isn't thrill and adventure seeking. This is experience seeking, going to these really different places. Or sweat lodge, I mean, this, people who are not having this as part of their culture might be interested in going to a sweat lodge to have, to back into an experience like this because of the sensory stimulation or living up in a tree house, you know, just really switching out your mindset. So these people are more engaged in the mind. They're still adventures of a sort, but achieved in a different way. Sensation seeking subscales, um, hedonistic pursuit of pleasure. Hedonism is just pursuit of pleasure for the sake of pleasure. And this is a, these images are exactly the kind of thing that I think of, like social, they're really socially involved. Um, might have um, different kinds of parties, sex, gambling. So the social disinhibition that you might see in people who are, are just let go of themselves in social situations. And then boredom susceptibility. This is an aversion to routine activities or work to dull and boring people, or just if they're in an environment that isn't changing, they get really restless. And I think about this movie that I really enjoyed, Office Space, um, in which this character that's featured here gets very, very frustrated with this boring, repetitive task and actually makes some big changes in his life. And um, so maybe you have this characteristic, you're susceptible to boredom if things aren't, aren't livened up. Um, we do have some information. There are gender differences in this scale. Men tend to have higher overall scores than women, but this gap has been reduced in past decades. Um, and the difference, you'd think it comes from women having more opportunities for thrill and adventure seeking, but actually it's a reduction in men's scores for thrill and adventure seeking. So men have tended to be higher in that area, but they're actually declining in that. And I was kind of curious about whether video games might play a role in that. Um, and then the items you'll see when you take the scale, like it might be a little outdated, like they're considering skiing to be this high risk, exciting activity, but I don't think many people consider it that way anymore. Um, I still do, but I think a lot of people consider it to be a pretty, not that big a deal. Um, and as you might guess, uh, sensation seeking dis declined steadily for both men and women from age 18 to 30. For both men and women, sensation seeking is at their highest at age 18. Um, for men though, that is a, a 3.6 out of five. For women, that's just a mean of 3.0 out of five. And then for both men and women, it declines um, through age 30 to, for men, they're at 3.0 and for a mean for women, the mean is 2.2. Um, there's a little bit involved in birth order, which I found was sort of interesting. Um, so firstborns and only children from homes with parents who are high in controlling lists and low in responsiveness, these people tend to have higher levels of disinhibition and boredom susceptibility. So if your parents are over controlling you and not particularly responsive to you, like often happens with firstborns or only children, then you're more likely to crave risks, but the risks that you crave are via social behavior, like you're likely more likely to be engaged in that super wild party sort of thing. Um, and you're less likely to be tolerant for routine tasks. And um, a strong religious affiliation was directly related to a relatively high level of parental care and to low sensation seeking. So, um, that you can see how these things tend to interrelate. So the more your parents care about you, it, it seems, and the less they try and micromanage your life, the less likely you are to need to seek out these extreme sensations. And finally, um, an interesting article is one that suggests that sensation seeking um, and addiction, um, so you might, we know and we'll study in our next content that sensation seeking and addiction are linked. Um, but what is the nature of that linkage? So um, 
sensation seeking did not strongly predict future addiction in high risk neighborhoods. So in high risk neighborhoods that have a lot of poor people, it didn't make that much difference. You were susceptible to addiction at about the same rate as people who weren't high in sensation seeking. But that might be because of these present risks that are pretty steady. Because in low risk neighborhoods, sensation seeking did predict future addiction more strongly. So in, in, high, in low risk neighborhoods, like affluent neighborhoods where there aren't a lot of gangs and other dangers, then your likelihood of becoming addiction was strongly linked to your trait your scores on the sensation seeking scale. So just a little side piece of information for you. So um, that is what I have for you on sensation seeking. I have a quick quiz. Jeremiah just gets crazy whenever he goes out at night drinking way too much and socializing. He's high in the SSS trait of, and the answer is disinhibition. Sandra is really wary of anything that might alter her perceptual field. She won't take any sort of drug. She thinks meditation opens a person up to evil and even becomes frightened when she experienced a tingling sensation during an intense prayer at church. She is low in the SSS trait of experience. Of experience.